She's suffered from bipolar disorder in the past. When I first met her, she wasn't on the proper medication. And some days, it would feel like she was constantly spiraling out of control. And other days, I would have a difficult time keeping up with her energy. It was really difficult in the beginning. I won't lie about that. There were times when we were dating that I was sure I wouldn't be able to give her the support that she needed. I can't tell you how often I would wipe away her tears during one of her depressive episodes and wonder how many more times I would have to do it before it was over. But as time went on, I realized that it would never be over. And it wasn't about me. This was her constant battle. And this was who she was. This was it. She wasn't broken. She didn't need fixing. Once her medication was sorted, it did, in fact, get easier. But God, I would have been with her regardless. I wanted to get all of that out of the way so you can understand that she would sometimes feel as foreign to me as any stranger I would pass on the street, even with meds. She would act funny and be totally withdrawn for days at a time. My wife is... was... My wife is an artist. She would write constantly so that her desk was covered in post-it notes, and she would lock herself on the balcony and paint for hours at a time, refusing to eat or drink anything. When she would finish something, whatever project she was working on, I would be the first she would unveil it to. Fantastic. They always evoked something in me that was deeply personal, and when I would read what she wrote or look on one of her paintings, I would feel closer to her than... I would any time we held each other or made love. After her manic-inspired frenzy, I would have her back for a few weeks and she wouldn't feel quite so strange to me. I would muse that she was like the sea. And she would roll her eyes at me. But I meant it. Calm and still, uproarious and drowning. Last year, she locked herself in her home office. I let her be the first day, but the second morning I knocked on the door and she cracked the door open to peer out at me from the dark room. She told me she was busy and that I just needed to give her some space. I kissed her on the forehead and left for work. She was still in that room when I came back home, so I went to bed alone again. I knew she was working hard. I could hear music coming from the room and I could hear her singing along. I only heard her leave the room once that night. She ran to the bathroom, I heard a flushing toilet, and then the familiar click of the door of her home office. The next morning, I went to check on her. The music was still playing a Pixies track. I knocked and waited to hear footsteps cross the floor on the other side of the door, but didn't hear anything. I thought maybe she'd not heard me, so I knocked again. Nothing. Just the music. She'd never done this and it worried me. Regardless of how locked in to a project she was, she always had time to speak to me when I would check on her. I panicked and banged on the door. Still nothing. This forced me to go to the kitchen, grab the key to her office, and unlock the door. I swung the door open with images of me finding her dead on the floor, flashing before my eyes. My heart was racing as I scanned the dark room. The window doors were wide open, leaving the curtains there whipping in the breeze. I moved to the balcony there and searched the ground, hoping to not find her down there. I didn't. She wasn't. She was gone. Immediately I called her phone and saw it vibrating on the floor near the closet. Maybe she left and went to the store. I, I didn't know that she was gone then. I hoped that she'd gone to the store, but when I looked in the driveway, I saw her bright red VW bug sitting there. I sat in her office chair for a bit, shell-shocked. I waited a few hours before calling the police. She never came back. And the police never found anything indicating that she was kidnapped. 
we never found her. Her family didn't know where she'd gone. It, it took me a long time to accept that she'd left us all. And even longer to accept that she'd left me. I say that, but honestly, I don't know that I have accepted it. This diary I found only cements that I haven't. I've become a husk. I took a month off of work after her disappearance, and since I've been back, I do the bare minimum. So that I can get home and lie in her home office. I moved the bed we used to share from the bedroom in there, and hung my clothes in the closet. I've hung her paintings on the ceiling so that they're the last things I see before drifting off into a fitful sleep. Each of them are abstract interpretations of everyday, normal things, made from red and blue sweeping brush strokes. One is a coffee cup, and yet so much more. Another is an airliner, as seen from the ground, and yet it feels as though I can feel the warm air coming off the engines on either side of its body. When I would squint, I would feel as though the red streaks make up one cohesive message. I eventually set about cleaning up the office and organizing things, but mostly just crying over every scrap of paper I found. I removed everything from her desk, and as I went to close a drawer I'd just cleared, I heard something slide from within. I pulled the drawer back out, thinking I must have missed something. It seemed empty, but as I looked at the corners of the drawer, I could see there was a false bottom. I pried up a thin piece of wood with my fingertips and found a worn journal. I knew my wife had problems with her mental illness. That was what I originally thought of after her disappearance. I wondered constantly if that was the reason for her sudden overnight departure, and this seemed to solidify that in a big way. I devoured that journal by phone light and sighed. No, I won't be transcribing her words here. Those are for me. Sorry. I will say that it was full of warnings about monsters hiding in her closet. At first glance, I thought it was probably just another work of fiction my wife had previously worked on, one I'd never read. It felt like gibberish. But within the pages I was mentioned... These were her real thoughts, her real dysfunctional, fucked up thoughts. I wanted to scream and be mad at her. I wanted to regret ever sticking it out with her. I was frustrated, and I know I didn't mean any of it. I know that. It's just rough. Don't get the wrong idea about me. I already hate myself enough over it. Something within those pages did stick out to me, though. She kept reiterating how important her paintings were. She kept saying that everyone thought they were just abstract blobs on canvas, but really they were a map. I sat the book aside and tried to sleep, staring up at those paintings. Just as it grew harder and harder for me to keep my eyes open, I saw it. I bolted out of the bed, flipping the overhead light on. I tore the paintings from the ceiling and began rearranging them on the floor. When I lined up the edges of the red streaks from one canvas edge to the next, I saw the word me. Frantically, I began matching up other pieces of art until the message was clear. Come find me in the closet. I don't know what I was thinking. It was like a dream, and I was like a madman, ripping the closet door open and tearing my clothes off the rack, moving my shoes out from the closet floor. There wasn't anything there. I don't know why I thought there would have been. It was an empty closet and I was beginning to feel foolish. I picked a work shirt and began straightening it on a hanger, preparing to put everything back when something caught my eye. I don't know any other way to explain it than to say that there was a hole in the closet floor. I blinked and it was gone. I moved back and forth. It was there, but you had to be looking at it from just the right angle. I approached the closet carefully and peered into the open hole in the floor. There was an ancient iron ladder leading down into pitch black. No matter how far I pushed my head down into the hole, I could not see the bottom. I stood from my hands and knees and 
look back over to the paintings scattered on the floor. I felt a stone in the pit of my stomach over knowing what I was going to do next. Down. I went down into the hole, taking one ladder rung after the other. I felt a sense of purpose like I'd never felt before as I descended. I was a ship, and this was wind in my sails. She was my ocean, and by God I was going to find her. It took an indeterminable amount of time before I reached the bottom of the ladder. I'd probably climbed down three football fields before I felt my foot hit what felt like concrete. I looked around and then back up. The bit of light coming from the office above me was now little more than a pinhole. Blackness reached out from all directions, tugging at me, it seemed. I couldn't see an inch past my own nose. I clicked on the light on my phone, and it helped a little more than not at all. Although I could see the ground, it was in fact concrete. Even without seeing it, I knew I was in a massive, solid room. I screamed for Alice. My own voice echoed back at me and through me. The surreal nature of this was not lost on me, but I knew I had to find her. She was here, wherever here was. I placed my hand on the wall the ladder was attached to, and began walking to the left of it, hoping to find... Well, I don't know what I was hoping to find. I felt the direction was walking in bend and curve to the right. Was I in some tunnel? The ground beneath me went at a very subtle decline. I wondered how much further underground I must go before I saw the very bottom of it. Would there ever be an end? I walked like that for ten minutes, twenty, before I saw a light that wasn't my own in the distance. It was flickering. It was fire. And it was coming from a lantern. I squinted to get a better look at it and stopped in my tracks. It was coming towards me. The lantern light rocked from the top of a staff secured in a wagon that someone was pushing. With each step, the light wavered as the stranger approached me. Alice? I approached them. I was running through the dark and I didn't even know it. I slammed into the wagon and grabbed the side of it with my free hand. The hunched, hooded figure pushing the wagon made a noise I was totally unfamiliar with. They stopped and grabbed the lantern from the end of the staff, illuminating the contents of the open wagon. Fish? It was a stupid first thought, I know that, but the smell hit me. It was sweet and rot all at the same time. Within the wagon was a mound of flesh, viscera, gore. I staggered away. The man, if that's what he was, pulled his hood back to rest on his back. And what exploded out of him was a shriek that ran my blood cold and took the air straight out of me. I looked upon the face of the humanoid creature not of this world and gasped. Metal hooks protruded from the skin around the corners of his mouth, pulled back with string so that his smile was perpetual, eternal. He had no eyes. Hungry? He asked, motioning to his selection. His voice whistled from him, nearly piercing my eardrums. Backing away, I tripped over something I couldn't see. I turned my phone light on it and saw it was a severed arm. I scrambled to my feet, kicking the thing away. Looking down at the ground with what little light I had, I saw the ground wasn't made of that familiar solid concrete, but something else entirely. The ground was cobbled together out of blood. Stripped muscle. Limbs tied together with repurposed skin. I ran. I fucking ran. I felt the ground beneath me breathing. The man-thing, whatever the hell it was, whistled after me melodically. It sounded like whistling, but I may have been mistaken. It felt like he was communicating in a way that I didn't understand. I found a wall made of millions of eyes blinking out of sync, watching me canter over each incongruity of the ground. I ignored them and moved through the massive gore structure, hoping against hope that I was moving in the right direction. 
I wanted nothing more than to close my eyes, but kept them open out of fear that I would fall over again. I don't know how I did it, but I found a ladder. I scrambled up into my wife's home office and slammed the closet door behind me. I don't know what I stumbled upon. And I don't know how long she's had to live with it. I've moved the bed back into the bedroom because I can still hear that whistling noise every so often. The wet snapping sound of a closing eye. I've locked the closet with chains. But I don't know if that will be enough. I have to find my wife. I know that. I will. I read through her diary again and again, now taking my wife's words more seriously. The words now seemed less like rambling. She'd detailed monsters living in the closet, and now I knew what that meant. Alice mentioned in her diary that it was hell. But that wasn't quite right either. It was another world, but not so far removed from our own. It was somewhere in between. It sounds like madness, but she said that our world was like a scab over a wound, and if someone were brave enough to pick at that scab, they'd find what was underneath. I don't know what that means. What I do know is that she's down there somewhere. And I'm going back. Just thinking of that man's face and his wagon of gore makes me queasy. I gathered up an old backpack that I used for hiking from back when I used to do stuff like that. I packed four bottles of water, two flashlights with backup batteries, jerky and chips, matches, a pocket knife, and an aluminum baseball bat. I wish I owned a gun, but I don't. I don't know how long it takes to get one, but Alice has been down there for long enough. Unlocking the closet door in her home office, I sat on the floor and stared at the spot where the hole would appear if I looked at it just right. I must have looked funny, staring into the solid boards of the floor of the closet for what felt like an hour, shifting in my sitting position every so often and waiting for it to show. I heard the echo of a massive chamber before I saw the hole appear. I heard a wet, dripping sound, and then I saw the hole. It didn't open up like a mouth. One moment it wasn't there, and then one moment it just was. I shimmied up to the edge of the hole as though I was trying to peer off the edge of a tall building. I wanted to get a good look at the entrance. I wanted to make sure there wasn't any creature waiting there for me. But there wasn't. I clicked on my flashlight and shone it into the opening. The blackness swallowed it up, but it still felt better than using the light on my phone. After taking a few heavy breaths and stealing my nerves, I hunkered down and began moving down the ladder. As I moved, I had to focus my attention on the ladder rungs in front of me. I'll admit I was afraid to look at the walls of the hole. I was afraid that if I saw it out of my peripherals, there would be an eye staring back at me or some unknown person's limb reaching out to flop against me. But I did look at the walls, and they were all gray concrete. Nothing to worry about so far. After reaching the bottom, I pivoted quickly, shining my light in all directions, waiting for something to jump out of the darkness. Nothing came. I stayed like that longer than I'd like to admit. I was scared shitless. The subterranean tunnel was colder than I remembered, and I pulled my pack closer around my shoulders. It made my teeth click, and I had to consciously keep my mouth closed. I pointed the light down the direction I'd gone last time, waiting to see that lantern bobbing in the distance. God, I didn't want to keep going. I wanted to climb back up that ladder, sell the house, and move somewhere sunny and warm. I knew I couldn't, though. I kept Alice in the forefront of my mind and began walking in the direction opposite I'd gone the last time I was here. I followed my translucent breath in the darkness, taking small steps so as to make as little noise as possible. I didn't want to be found out. Found out by what? I don't know. There was a low growl from somewhere in the direction I was moving towards, and I stopped dead in my tracks, 
looking back where I came to see if my light reached the ladder. It was out of sight, so I turned my attention back to the blackness in front of me. That place where the growl had come from. It was so low that at first I thought maybe I'd imagined it, and I took another step forward. Then came another growl. That's when I heard something moving towards me, sluggishly at first, but picking up speed as it slid across the ground. I pressed myself against the wall and covered my flashlight with my free hand and waited and waited. Then I felt something slipping over my right shoe. I bit my tongue and felt blood in my mouth. I didn't, I couldn't scream. The thing was touching me in the darkness, but I was still sure that the creature had not seen me. I didn't know how close I was. It felt like a serpent of some kind sliding slowly over my foot and further in the direction from where I'd come. With every edge forward, the slimy thing made that same low growl, as though moving was difficult for it. Hey, how'd you get here? Someone whispered in my ear. I could feel hot breath down my neck from the lips that spoke the words, and my spine was replaced with a steel rod. A whimper escaped me. My back was against the wall. There was no way someone was behind me. It was just my imagination. Or was just this place playing tricks on me? I waited for the thing moving over my foot to slither further down the massive tunnel. Mmm, you smell good, came the voice again. The serpent didn't seem to hear it. When I was sure the creature was gone, I stepped away from the wall and shone my light against it, scanning the flat surface. I sighed, relieved that nothing was there. Sure that nothing was going to come out of the wall and grab me. I stopped covering my light and squinted in the direction where the serpent thing had gone, back towards the ladder. I still heard those low growls. I started moving away from it at a light jog, still trying to make as little noise as possible. The ground beneath me started subtly declining, and I was reminded of the first time I'd come down here. I kept waiting to see that light in the distance, but that hooded figure pushing the cart never appeared, and I continued. It wasn't long before I came across a staircase off to the left. It led further down. Not for the first time, I wondered, who would build something like this? It has always been, and will always be. I felt that whisper down my neck again and spun, almost falling over and down the stairs. No one and nothing was there. I shook the chill that was beginning to settle into my bones, and I grabbed the railing of the staircase and began moving further down. When I shot my light in front of myself, I could see no end to the stairs. I stopped holding onto the handrail when it took the shape of intestines. I'm no doctor, but I'm sure that's what it was. Slippery, rubbery, full of gas. At some point, the stairs beneath my feet took on another form altogether. Each of my footfalls stopped making those familiar thuds against solid ground, and they sounded stickier. Every time I went to pull one of my feet up, it would make a shloop sound. I ignored the ground and tried not to look there. It began to rain. It was blood. I thought it was water at first, but no one could ignore that thick iron smell. It ran down my body like a viscous chemical, not like water at all. This only made the cold in the structure unbearable. I pulled my shirt up around my neck, but it was too late. The stuff was soaking right through me. I looked up to the ceiling and saw no end there either. Only the droplets of blood that fell from the darkness above. I shuddered. I found the end of the staircase and happened to glance at the ground for only a brief moment. It was that same unimaginable, indescribable horror I'd seen my last time here. I walked some more in an open chamber that echoed with each of my wet footsteps. The cold was getting worse. Some figure was up ahead. It was feminine and small in the darkness. Don't ask me why I ran then, because I can't tell you. Alice! I screamed as I went to the figure I could barely see in the darkness. I tripped over something that felt like a hand attempting to grab at my shoe and I slammed into a figure. 
I fell over top of it. I heard a shattering sound like glass. I lost my light in the tumble and scrambled in the darkness to find it. I wrestled it from a set of disfigured fingers protruding from the ground. I searched the ground for the figure but saw only bits of guts and dark red limbs. I shone the light around some more and the light fell upon more figures. They were like statues. I approached one. It was normal. I mean to say it wasn't some monster. It was a frozen woman glowing in red. She was covered in that thick rain that came from above. It took me a moment to realize she was, at some point, a living person. It was getting colder. I could feel the blood rain slowing my motions. If I stayed in place for too long, I would become like her. Frozen in place, I studied the woman's face. It wasn't Alice. I approached the other dead statues to be sure they weren't her either. They weren't. I looked back to the place where I'd shattered that first unlucky soul. I hoped it wasn't Alice and continued through the massive chamber as the rain became deafening and I could barely see through it. There was an incessant weeping coming from no particular direction. It seemed to echo inside of my own skull. The rain began to form puddles on the uneven ground and I was forced to look upon it so as not to step in them. I moved through innumerable faces frozen in blood-red terror. They would have been beautiful if they weren't what they were. The further I marched into that cavern, the more there were. My movements were slowing and I felt hypothermic. I was cold even though the place seemed to have no wind that I could detect. It got to be that I had to move so slowly through the frozen bodies that I wouldn't knock them over. Their fingers were outreached, and every so often they would snag on my wet clothes and I would have to meticulously shift. But one caught me and I didn't notice. The figure fell into the next one beside it and I ran, knocking over the dead statues. They fell and crumbled behind me. The weeping grew louder. I killed them. Had they still been alive this whole time? I hope not. I ran through the crowd as a million souls called out to me in a cacophony of wails and splintering glass bodies. There was a door. I could see a door. It was just ahead. There were still forms clinging to the edges of it. They had come so close. I reached the great big metal door and swung it inward, shattering the outreached hands of those that had almost escaped. I swung the door closed behind me. It was a small room. It wasn't raining in here. It wasn't cold. You've murdered them. That whisper came again and trailed off. The weeping has followed me here. It echoes from everywhere. I wrung the blood out of my clothes, but that smell will stick with me forever. I've huddled in a corner, attempting to get that chill out of my body, rubbing my arms with my hands. I don't know what this place is, but I still have the feeling as though she's here. She must be. I studied my red stained body and my left pinky finger caught my attention. It was darker than the others, like red wine. I tapped it and felt a hollowness in it. It reverberated through me. Then it shattered into a billion pieces of dust and fell away from my hand. I swallowed hard and I wanted to wail out in the very same way those statues had. It's hard to eat and drink in here. The water I brought is thick, and the snacks I eat are brittle like old crackers. After examining the room, I see there's another door on the opposite side. I think I'll rest here for a bit and move on when my skin doesn't feel so cold. The least I could do was wipe my face dry of the blood. So I did that. I still felt sticky all over. Thank God the pack I brought with me is waterproof. The contents of it are only slightly ruined. It has occurred to me that I didn't describe the room I'm standing in. 
It almost looks as though some entity has sliced a segment of a mine tunnel out of its line and placed it here. The walls are dirt and stone, and each corner of the room has a wooden pillar holding the ceiling up. They're beginning to bow. I was afraid to put too much pressure against them. The last thing I needed was to drown in a wave of dirt. The screams and howls went on, and I felt as though I may lose my mind if I were to be forced to listen to them anymore. I could feel them growing louder, and they were impossible to ignore. Each squeal threatened to demolish my senses and send me into a catatonic fit. If before it felt like they were rattling my skull, it then felt as though my brain may at any moment split open like a bag too full. I gripped my baseball bat in both hands, being careful not to rub the spot where my pinky finger had been not too long ago. I reached out for the handle of the new door. You scared, said the whisper. I jumped back, again holding the bat with both hands and pivoting all around, looking for the source of the voice. Nowhere. I was scared, but in the relative safety of this room, I was bolstered. Fuck you! I shouted at the dirt walls around me. She's dead, you know. She held on so long for you to come and rescue her. The voice hissed. Eventually, it laughed. She had no fight left in her. I made sure of that. Liar. The word came out small. At first I thought it was raining again. It wasn't. It was tears. Humans are so fragile. Her insides were soft and runny. I shouldered through the bodiless words and shoved the door open. It was met with daylight. It was light. I stepped from the small room I'd been hiding in and into my... our home. I was in the hallway and I saw sunbeams shooting through the windows. It looked calm outside. I saw my neighbor on his front porch sitting in one of those rickety plastic chairs while sipping on a frothy cold one. I was aghast and allowed the baseball bat to slide limply in my right hand while I walked down the hall. I turned and looked back at the small room I'd come from. It was still there. I could see the bowing wooden pillars and the dirt walls. But it was in the spot where a bathroom should have been. I heard birds, and that is when it occurred to me that I could no longer hear those screams. The day outside seemed idyllic and gentle and soft and normal. Then I smelled something stronger than the blood on me. It was bacon. I heard the popping sounds of sizzling meat coming from the kitchen. Someone was in the kitchen. I crept down the hallway to the threshold that led into the kitchen, and the, the smell grew stronger there. And I heard someone shifting along the linoleum floors there. I bit my lip and mentally prepared myself. I was shaking. And there she was. There she was, Alice, at last, in our home with her, her earbuds on, dancing like no one was watching while cooking breakfast. She was wearing her boy shorts and her no-show socks and her hair back in a ponytail and just, oh God, it was her through and through. She jumped at the sound of the metal bat clanging out of my hands and popped her earbuds out. Her expression was one of horror as she looked at me in, in that sweet honeysuckle voice she said oh my god are you okay did you hurt yourself she saw my missing finger and recoiled a few times while examining it in her own hands i couldn't speak hell i could i could hardly breathe it was a dream a, a terrible nightmare of some kind i slid against the stud of the threshold i've been putting my weight against and crumpled to the floor she hunkered down with me i i shook violently while she held me Shh, shh, it's all right. We can just sit here for a while. That's okay, okay? She rubbed my spine. We'll do that, and then we'll get you all cleaned up. It'll be all right. I believed it would be. I showered and wrapped my hand. She offered me some breakfast, but I, I couldn't eat. I was exhausted, and I wanted nothing more than to sleep all of this off. Even though my body wanted to give up, my mind was still in that place. 
We laid together in bed. We can lay here together forever, she said. Yeah, forever. I smiled the biggest, dumbest grin. Perhaps through hell I had stumbled upon a pocket of heaven. It was like moving through a dream. I turned to her in bed and as I cradled her face, I could have gotten lost in those water green eyes for days. Alice? I was frozen in fear as I said her name. It came out before I could even fully comprehend what I was seeing. Your eye. Her eyelashes on her right eye grew longer and longer as she stared at me. Forever. The word fell from her now drooping lips as though it were caught on a record needle. The eyelashes formed legs and pressed against her cheek to pry the eye from the socket. I jumped out of bed, throwing the comforter against the wall. The comforter smacked against the wall wetly, and it wasn't a blanket anymore. It was a patchwork skin and hair. I watched as the eye's legs continued to grow. Its appendages made a bone-snapping pop as the eyeball entirely freed itself from her face. Her form lay flat upon the bed, staring one-eyed into the ceiling. For ever can't expect us to get every detail right, can ya? Whispered that bloodless whisper. The eyeball skittered across the bed like a newly born calf and threw its body into the dresser. It stood two feet tall on its innumerable legs. It stopped, stood up straight, and shifted to look at me. It mostly sounds stupid in retrospect, but the only words I could find to sum up what was happening were, oh, What the fuck? And then, Why? I looked at the eye, then at the door to the bedroom, then back at the eye. The creature mimicked my glances. I shouted and threw my arms out, attempting to look larger. It crouched and looked up at me. Was it scared of me? I thought this for about one second before one of its limbs shot out and stabbed me in the right shoulder. It was hot and metallic. It pulled its spidery leg out and stood tall again. I could feel the wet warmth running out of my shoulder, and I gritted through the pain. I ran into the bathroom and slammed the door shut, pressing my back against it. I grimaced as my own blood began to pull beneath me. The thing slammed into the door and shook the frame. I held steady. Again and again, it bounced off the wood until I was sure the creature would splinter the thing into a million pieces, and me along with it. It went silent on the other side of the door. Had it given up? I looked at the droplet of my own blood in the floor, and that's when I saw the thing. Thousands of legs sliding underneath the space at the bottom of the door. I felt one of the limbs scratch against my ankle, and I withdrew from the door, watching the thing slide legs first underneath it. I waited for it. I knew what to do. I saw the eye begin to edge its way underneath the door. I lifted my foot as high as I could, and I brought it down so hard I was afraid I might dislocate my knee. Its innards ran out of its iris, and its limbs shot out in all directions, scrambled. Then it was limp. I didn't dare go back into the bedroom, for the only thing I heard coming from there was the word forever. I wondered if that doppelganger would say that well. Forever. The bat was still lying at the other end of the hallway. A lot of good it's done me so far. I went to retrieve it while nursing my shoulder. It was hard to get a good grip on the thing. The bat hung limply from my hands for a moment before it fell back to the ground. I bent back over to pick it up and slipped in my own blood. It was getting harder and harder to move. My vision was going. I took a knee and tried to prop myself back to my feet with the bat butt slimped into a sitting position. Everything was going blurry. I caught the brief glimpse of dust particles settling on a nearby windowsill. The world around me was shrinking into a needle point. I jerked a few times, attempting to jumpstart my body. I, I just had to move. I had to get back up. This wasn't over. God damn it, this wasn't how I was going to die. I was falling apart inside. 
I groaned and moved my head back and forth. I heard the metal clatter of the baseball bat once again as it banged the ground against me. This was it. I was dying. I closed my eyes and focused on my breathing. In, out. In, out. My eyes opened. I was standing in the small room in this hellish place. I had never left. I had never gone through the door. My hand was still stretched out in front of me. I heard that bodiless laugh once again. This time it was shrill, boisterous. I'm losing my grip on reality. This place is messing with my head. It's infected me somehow. I can feel it coursing through my veins now. Maybe that makes no sense, but it is the very best way I can describe it. I wanted to twist into a spiral of oblivion, fall into some dark abyss, and forget all of who I am and what I know. The vulgarity in which this place has touched me cannot be put into words, and so I am sorry for that. I spun around the small room, touching the dirt walls and the ground so as to make sure they were tangible, real. How can I trust that? I can't. But it's better than nothing. I reached for the door I'd never opened and twisted its rusty knob. It creaked and dust shook from its frame and it pushed into a dimly lit room. I adjusted the bat, arcing it over my shoulder, prepared to swing at the very next thing I saw. Stepping into this new room, I flinched at every imaginary sound. This room was much larger. The walls seemed to go up into infinity and meet one another at some unseen point, for I saw no ceiling. My footsteps echoed. There were candles everywhere, millions of them at varying heights. They rested on the stone floor, their flames flickered restlessly at my presence. Hello? I said timidly into the room. My own voice echoed back at me and I was struck by how meek it sounded. The candles lying on the floor were arranged in such a way that their negative space creates a three-foot walkway. I've been walking in between these candles for hours now, writing as I go. This room seems to never end. Every hour... Well... To be honest with you, I'm not sure. Time has no meaning here. Every so often I sit in this path and rest. My feet are aching. The candles do well enough to light the immediate area around me, but sometimes my eyes stray up and I wonder... How far does that ceiling go? How far down am I? I'm now sure that it goes on forever. I feel as though someone is watching me, standing among the candles. But every time that I turn to face the voyeur, they're gone, and I'm faced with nothing more than the dancing shadows upon the wall that those small flames create. At least it's warm. Is she dead? As time went on, it began to feel as though it truly would go on forever. I was no longer walking down this massive, never-ending hallway, but falling through it, and spiraling through the darkness. Or so it seemed. I walked. It was days or minutes, I can't tell you for sure. One thing I know is that I have a nasty blister forming on one of my heels. It makes me wince with every terrible step now. It rubs and my shoes feel like sandpaper. I've said it before, but I really feel like my mind is slipping all the time. I hear sounds that aren't there. I see things that aren't there. And sometimes I feel emotions run through me that aren't even my own. I grow angry at Alice, at myself, at this place. The further along I went, the more that this cavernous, subterranean layer's scent became unbearable. I wonder if there are any sulfur deposits here. I checked the stone walls with one of my flashlights and the beam scanned its smooth surface. I can imagine some large, powerful hands eroding them, so that they are just so. In my boredom, I attempted to blow at one of the candles along the walkway. I bent down, cupped my hands around my mouth, and blew one out. Its light was gone. I watched it. 
It stayed flameless for a few moments and then flickered back to life. Peculiar. Though that's the least interesting thing I've seen in my time here. Just as I was about to lose my nerve and shout into the open hall, it ended. Or in the very least, the light did. There seemed to be a very fine mathematical line where the candles on either side of me ceased. And there was only darkness ahead. Coming from the recesses of the darkness in front of me, I heard a familiar noise. It came sliding towards me slowly at first, then picking up speed. It was slithering and growling. It was the creature that I had crossed paths with in the initial chamber. I knew it. Focusing my flashlight ahead with my left hand, I reared the baseball bat in my right. I saw this horrendous creature for the first time and could not believe that I had been so cavalier to its presence before. If all cosmic entities were contrived from any one place, it was from this. Its flesh moved aqueously, unlike any living thing I've ever seen. Its eyes lolled and moved to every feasible point with stunning speed. Its mouth was wide and circular and seemed to never close, for it breathed and heaved from some gaseous organs deep within. With each arduous breath that sighed out came that growl. The thing's head stood upon a neck about two feet long, and its six or seven limbs wriggled all about, never touching the ground. Its bent and awkward body sat upon a lower half like a worm. Its lower body glistened from some unnameable moisture. The horror slid along the polished floor, leaving a mucus trail coming right towards me. It was an amalgamation of the worst things. I was frozen, watching it come at me with my flashlight focused on it, and all of its eyes focused on me. It growled or breathed as it approached. I dropped the flashlight, backing away and readying my bat. I felt its hot breath. Its mouth seemed to move and try to form something adjacent to words, but the musculature of its form didn't allow it. I swung while closing my eyes and felt the end of the bat meet something like cartilage. I felt a spray of hot liquid shower my face and I squinted through it. The thing had rolled and fallen onto its side. I had demolished several of its eyes. It squirmed and thrashed and I stepped around it to look at its face. It stared up at me. The horror's eyes were watery. Again, the thing's mouth seemed to try to form something other than a wide open O to no avail. It groaned. I brought the bat back down over its head until its face was level with the ground and its limbs ceased their twitching. This makes me sound like a crazy person, I'm sure of it. But knowing that I can fight back against these things down here and actually win makes me feel as though I might have a chance. She's alive. She must be. God, if she's not, I will kill every last one of these fucking things down here. I wiped my bat against my pant leg and found my flashlight on the ground. Walking into the dark, I heard more slithering, more groaning and growling. I glanced over my shoulder, expecting that the dead creature had somehow revived itself near the candle path. It still lay there. Those noises were coming from the darkness in front of me. I walked into it with my light cutting through the darkness. I struck out in the dark several more times, tearing the creatures down in their places in a flash of light and a pound of the bat. I did not stop until I didn't hear anything in the darkness. Scanning the immediate area around me, the creatures lying there resembled no singular form. I was surprised at myself. I looked back over my shoulder at the candle pathway and I could barely see them in the distance. There was no other choice. I sure as hell wasn't going to turn back now. Thinking of walking that long hallway again made my feet ache. I pushed on with my trusty bat at the ready. Steadily, I heard rushing water and moved wearily. There was a river? There was a river. The stone floor beneath my feet almost fell out from under me and I had to point the light down. There was a gentle river. The sound was so normal. It was something I might have heard on the surface world and this threw me for a loop. The water below looked calm. 
I searched around in the darkness and found a post attached to the edge of the stone floor. A rope was tied there. I followed the rope line with my light and saw it was attached to a dinghy in the water. No way, I said. That haunting, bodiless voice came back. You must, you know. Why? So the water can turn into lava? So that a kraken can swallow me whole? Something about getting in a boat and putting my fate so entirely in the dark magic of this place did not sit well with me. You must save her. It laughed. You must save her before it's too late. The voice said this in a fake panicky way. I looked down at the dinghy as it bobbed in the water and bounced against the edge of the floor with a thick thonk. I sighed because I knew it was right. The bodiless voice chuckled again. <laughs> I know you will. Oh, yeah? Yes, you will. I stepped into the small boat and began rolling the slack of the rope. I'll kill you. I pushed against the stone floor and washed as the stream pulled me further away. I gathered the rope and put it in my pack, sitting down. I was grateful for being able to rest properly. If you don't give her back to me, I swear, I'll kill you. I know it hurt me. I allowed myself to be carried away on the whims of the water and hardly paid attention to where it went or the makeup of my surroundings. I was lost in thought. Remembering her was getting harder, and it had been that way since she disappeared. Attempting to construct her as a living, breathing person in my mind was a near impossibility. You can remember people all you want, but it is another thing entirely to try to put them together as they were. It had been a little over a year since I'd walked in to find her office empty, and yet I could hardly put together her laugh. I knew her face, and I thought I would have it right, and then whenever I would look at a photo of her sometime the following year, I would constantly have thoughts that never lined up. I would imagine her hair looking a particular way when she would wear it back, only to have that contradict the photo. I always knew her eyes were green and vibrant, but... I'd always be caught off guard whenever faced with exactly how stunning they were in a photo. Memories are funny that way, aren't they? Imagining how someone smelled, keeping their clothing unwashed just so you could keep that scent around, be reminded of it every day. The smell was fading, and eventually you'd be clinging on to something that smells like nothing anymore. I hate that. The tunnel this river ran through was wide, and the overhanging stalactites had some incandescent quality that meagerly illuminated the river, and I could see that the water was black, daring me to stick a finger in and lose it. I ate some of the snacks and drank some of the water I'd brought with me. The dreary light of the tunnel withdrew a melancholy essence from me, and I found it difficult to keep my mind on the presence. I'm unsure if that is due to some magic quality that this place has on me, or if I was just feeling that way due to my own tired body. When we met, the two of us were at a bar. I'd gone with a few of my friends I knew from college under the guise of having a few beers with friends. Really, we were all single and looking to go home with someone else that night. All of us a bunch of awkward, fledgling IT grads covered in acne and neck beards. Me and all the other guys that I'd gone with were more comfortable huddled around a table top game than we were picking up women. We stayed in a constant group at one of the high tables near the bar, ogling women and cracking jokes amongst ourselves more than we were talking to any. I think we were just trying to wait for one of us to show genuine interest in talking to some lady before the rest of us could join in on pressuring the weak link into talking to them. That was me. There were no ringing bells or harps when I saw Alice. 
She did look good, though, I can tell you that much. She was with her boyfriend at the opposite end of the bar, and I sipped my beer while thinking how amazing it would be if I had the balls to go and win over a girl like that. One of the friends I'd come with, probably the one closest to me at the time, was named Andrew. He noticed me staring this girl down like a weirdo and nudged me. Careful, Matthew, he looks pretty big, he said in reference to Alice's then-boyfriend. He did look pretty big. The rest of our table caught on to what Andrew was saying and started whooping and hollering drunkenly, saying things like, Come on, man, a wise man once said, all you gotta do is go grab her ass, or fight him. Stupid kids saying stupid things. Still, even while riding on that boat through this place, it made me smile. At some point, we switched from bottled beer to shots, and after that, I don't remember. I continued to watch the pretty girl at the end of the bar, and at points I vaguely remember the boyfriend noticing me noticing her. I tried to avert my eyes, but she held some gravitational pull over them. He seemed to grow angrier and angrier. I could feel him staring through me. Finally, the boyfriend left her, probably to relieve himself. That's when my friends started in again. Go talk to her! Hurry, man! All smiles. Even I was smiling. I pieced the following from the flashes of memory I had from the night and Andrew retelling it to me the next morning. I staggered over to her. We spoke briefly. The boyfriend came back. Something I do remember is someone digging into my shoulders with both hands and lifting me out of my bar stool mid-conversation. I spun around, falling over and taking the bar's string light decorations with me in a glorious faceplant. I saw the legs of someone wearing tight jeans and attempted to scramble away through them to safety. The legs locked around my waist and I was stuck. I struggled but was unable to free myself. Try as I might, I could not buck the angry boyfriend. Then I felt someone's fist coming down and hitting my bottom. Blearily, I screamed, Get off of my ass! While still attempting to shimmy through the boyfriend's legs. It was at this point, Andrew would tell me later, that everyone in the bar grew silent and focused in on the ruckus we were creating. Some patrons bawling in laughter and some staff shocked. A flurry of blows came down on my backside. Don't ask me how, but I managed to twist sideways and pull myself entirely through the man's legs. I scrambled around to face him while trying to get to my feet, only to get tied up in the mess of decorative lights I got myself wrapped up in. I jerked and wriggled around, watching the boyfriend turn while coming at me. Somehow, I'd wrapped the line of lights around his ankle, and in my panic jerking to get away from him, I brought him down like a tree. His head smacked a nearby high table, and he was stunned, giving me enough time to untangle myself and run out of the bar with my friends trailing behind, laughing and cackling under the moonlight sky. The next morning, my back was bruised to hell, and when I called to ask Andrew the specifics of the night, the girl came rushing back to mind. I returned to pay my tab later in the evening and apologized for the mess I'd made, totally prepared to pay for whatever damage I'd caused to the bar. There she was, standing behind the bar, wiping down the counter. Without even thinking, I immediately turned around and walked out. I stood on the curb a long time spying in through the wide open window of the bar and pacing back and forth. I heard the door of the bar open as I stood on the edge of the sidewalk, staring at the pavement beneath my feet. A stranger approached me from behind. Hey, you're the ass man, aren't you? I turned to confront the person standing there. It was Alice. I could feel the blood rush into my face as I stammered through my words trying to explain myself. Whoa. She put up her hand and lit a cigarette. It's all right. I'm not going to report you to the owners. I'm just here for my break. I I'm really sorry. It's okay, she said. I, I didn't know you worked here. Yeah. She twisted around and walked over to a bench adjacent to the entrance of the bar. Mind if I sit? She nodded at the seat beside her. I sat. I don't know what I said last night. I'm really sorry for making an ass out of myself. That's why we call you the ass man.
She laughed and shrugged, focusing on her cigarette. I promise I'm not a creep. I know that. You're really nice. I mean, I could barely understand a lot of what you were saying, but what I could pick up on. You seem nice. Good. <sighs> I sighed. At least I've got that going for me. She smiled at me reassuringly. Reggie didn't hurt you too bad, did he? No. A little sore, but I'll be alright. I shifted in my seat and felt a ping run up my lower back. Well, you certainly left him looking worse for wear. I thought of how he smacked against the table the previous night. I really didn't mean to. Is he alright? Isn't that funny? What? The first thing he said about you was, I'll kill that son of a bitch if I ever see him again. And here you are worrying about his boo-boo. Sorry. Stop saying sorry. It gets old quick. She said this curly, but blew out a puff of smoke and laughed at me some more. Sorry? We looked at one another, and she cut her eyes in a way that said she knew I was trying to make a joke. Then silence fell over us, and I watched her smoke her cigarette as the streetlights came on, casting a beautiful glaze over her round face. Well, she said, I guess you better come on in and apologize to the owners. That's what you're here for, isn't it? I nodded and we went in together. The owners weren't very happy with me, but I reimbursed them in full and carried on returning to the establishment, just so that I could converse with the pretty lady from the other side of the bar. This blossomed into a wonderful friendship that I would have been happy to have if nothing else. I went on dates with other women while she carried on dating Reggie. This went on for six or seven months. Reggie eventually fell out of the picture, and I worked up the courage to ask Alice out on a proper date. I remember after our first date we lay together naked in my small apartment, and she turned to me, pushing strands of hair out of her face. You really don't remember what you said to me. I looked at her, puzzled. The night we met, when you got your nickname. I rolled my eyes. No, I really don't. You said you'd go to hell and back for me. There was no way around it. I blushed at this. We slept in a sweaty, tangled mess of each other's limbs. It wasn't until after the initial honeymoon phase that I truly got a look at her demons. I was helping her carry in groceries to her place, sorting them out on the kitchen counter when she turned to me and said, Sometimes I want to die. This threw me for a loop. I'd never heard anyone express anything like that in my entire life, let alone be so blunt about it. She shrugged and then went back out to her car to retrieve the rest of the groceries. I stood there for a few seconds, staring at the door she'd walked out of and wondering if she was joking. It wasn't until much later that I would fully experience her wrath. We moved in together and that was a mess all by itself. She grew more sanguine and slept most of the day and night until she was forced to put on her work clothes at the ring of six consecutive alarms. She fought me when I mentioned therapy or medication. When the dust would settle, her shoulders would slump and she would express to me that she was worried the pills would change who she was. That wouldn't be me, she cried. This always left me at a loss of what to say. I couldn't argue whether or not that was true, and I couldn't even imagine losing myself. Who was I to say she should take them? It was the same song and dance for a very long time. Her bipolar disorder grew worse. Sometimes she'd stay awake for days at a time, starting some new hobby or artist project. Sometimes she would sleep for days at a time. I like to believe the thing that made her take medication seriously was me having my own mental breakdown, but who knows. It got easier. Things felt better. She seemed happy. We got married and mended and damage done. It was wonderful. All of a sudden, I was very aware of my surroundings as I snapped out of my thoughts, looking around the small dinghy and cave-like tunnel. I was still exhausted, but it did seem to help that I could crane my back and stretch my legs in the small boat. I watched the stalactites overhead pass by as the river pulled me along and wondered how they glowed. 
Was it magic? Was it some natural chemical formation? Up ahead, I saw something in the black water. It took a long moment before I realized it was a body lying horizontal on the surface of the water. It, it was coming towards me. I looked down into the moving water and realized this was an impossibility. The water was still moving me in the boat along the tunnel. That would mean that the body was drifting against the current. Baffled, I watched the body approach the front of the dinghy and thud against the wooden side. As it passed me by, I saw that it was bloated and rotting. The smell was like a mixture of rotting eggs and meat. No. It was the sulfurous smell I'd caught onto early in the voyage. This was where that smell was coming from. I held my wrist up to my nose, attempting to block it out. That's when I noticed the body wasn't alone. Up ahead, I saw innumerable bodies coming my way. Some spaced out, some tangled together, and rotting together so that their soft flesh had formed some cohesive bond. It made me gag. I saw the eyes of the dead, all white and gray and sad. They filled the width of the tunnel, some of them missing the dinghy entirely and some bumping up against it. At a point, it got to be that I was surrounded by them and the dinghy stopped moving altogether. The small boat came ashore of an island in the tunnel formed of bloated, dead bodies. Looking further down the tunnel, I saw there was no way I could push the dinghy through them. I sighed and grabbed up my bat, pulling my pack over my shoulders. Looking down at the bodies squished together, I made sure not to step on any faces and began walking atop them. Each step was misery. It was like walking over drying mud, and I had to be sure to step carefully so as not to lose a shoe in someone's gut. I think I saw a wooden dock up ahead. There was a lantern bobbing on the end of a staff sticking from a wagon. Someone was standing next to it. You said you'd go to hell and back for me. I walked over the bodies while shining my light ahead. I came to the wooden dock and looked at the man-thing standing there in its cloak. It stood next to its wagon as I stepped upon the ancient wood. He revealed his face with those horrible hooks protruding through his cheeks, maintaining his forever smile. He asked me, Hungry, as he motioned to his little wagon of fish-smelling gore. For the first time, I realized he must have been pulling the bodies ashore and butchering them. Whoever he was distributing these goods to, I hadn't the faintest idea. As I looked upon his face, I didn't feel the same surreal horror I had on our first encounter. His face muscles twitched, and I, as I looked into his eyes, I realized they weren't menacing, but rather sad. I moved to his wagon of blood goods and pressed my shoe against its side, pushing the thing into the water and bodies below with one swift shove. No! He screamed painfully. He grabbed at his face. Why would you do that? I shrugged at him and walked along the dock as the creature man attempted to fish out his cart that was now wedged between the faceless victims below. I was a man in a dream moving through this world with no other thing beyond my intent to save my wife. There was little more that this place could do to me. It could set me ablaze, tear me asunder, slurp my brain out and replace it with mush. I couldn't care. There were buildings here, structures made of rusted metal or waterlogged wood, starting off small and hut-like, but as I moved through them it became something of a proper city. For a brief moment I was struck with the thought that this was where all living things dwelled here. The air was damp and stank of death. There were pylons jutting from poles that dotted the stone walkways. Running between each of the pylons were millions of wet, fibrous tissues. It was as though I was standing inside of a neural network. I saw from the windows of some of these craggy buildings that there were eyes peering out at me. They glowed yellow. Scary, isn't it? 
I wouldn't blame you if you turned around and tried to escape, said the disembodied voice that followed me. It no longer made me jump when it decided to make its presence known. I ignored it and continued to walk along the stone pathway I found myself on. Up ahead, I noticed that the fibrous tissues overhead slacked in places and lit up areas similar to streetlights. I clicked off my flashlight, and as I continued to walk, the damp air grew thicker and felt as though it was actually coating my lungs in some thick chemical substance. Still, my pace quickened. Stop! shouted the voice in my ears. It took on that same echo-like quality rattling inside of my own head. I stopped. What? I asked the open air in front of me. A light opened up to my left and I turned to face it. I was standing directly in front of an open alleyway in between two buildings. The structures on either side were made of bright red stone. The fibrous tissues from above took on a mind of their own and began worming their way through the alleyway, lighting the way in strange, blipping flickers. Hesitantly, I turned to look back the way I'd been moving, seeing the stone walkway change and move. The ground was breathing again. I looked back to the alleyway and saw that the tissues snaking their way down the alley were meeting something solid at the other end and curling in and upon themselves. I sighed and took a few heavy steps down the dimly lit alley, making sure to watch my footing so as not to step on any of the things lighting my way. It felt like the walls on either side of me might swallow me up at any moment, but still I pushed on and found the ends of the fibers curling around the edges of the first step of the staircase. I took to the stairs, taking them two at a time. It took no time at all before I came upon a door. But it wasn't just any door. This one was familiar to me. I turned back to look down. A sickening realization came over me. The stairs went on forever, down. I was well above this ancient city and could see its awkward layout from my aerial viewpoint. Immediately I was struck with a wavering vertigo. My whole body seemed to tilt and I was forced to my hands and knees on the first couple of top steps. There was absolutely no way I'd gone up these steps. It was another trick of this place. I gripped the steps beneath me with white-knuckled hands digging into the wood with my nails. The city was nearly beautiful from way upon high. It had an organic quality to it that no man-made structures could ever hope to achieve. The stone walkways looked so much less menacing when you could see them bathed in the lights of the fibrous, fleshy ropes that ran over the place. The lights traveled along the ropey things like synapses coming to life. I took in the scenery of the city and attempted to control my breathing. After a few moments of deep gasping and wiping away my cold sweat, I was able to calm my nerves and twist around to look at the door. I focused on the knob, and that helped my uneasiness at being up so high. I charged at the door, twisted the knob, and swung the door inward. I stood in my wife's home office again. It was nighttime, and everything was dark. All of her paintings and writings were here. I thought that maybe the place was twisting my mind again, but those articles stood as evidence to suggest that this really was the really real world. I turned to look back into the closet and saw that there was still a cosmic city there, staircase and all. Go and don't come back, said the disembodied voice. I knew that if I walked over, shut the door, showered, and chalked it all up to bad dreams, that that place would disappear forever. I don't know how I could have known something like that, but I know it. I looked back down at the place where my pinky had been. I'm coming, I said, pushing back through the doorway into that hellish place. I slammed the door behind me without glancing back and staggered down those towering stairs in weak and shaky-legged motions. 
sure that I would fall away into the open air with each step. I reached the bottom of the stairs and exited the alley, moving onto the stone street as it breathed beneath me. My feet pounded beneath me relentlessly without my body knowing I was sprinting. I moved through the city, not sure where I was going, but knowing that I was getting closer to the epicenter. The air was thick again. The humidity forced the hair on my head to cling and made the baseball bat slick in my hands. But still, I pushed on. Before I knew it, the buildings disappeared. Instead, there were massive rock formations and open holes in the stone floor. I moved toward one of the holes and it swallowed all light there. Before peeking my head over the edge, a massive cloud of gaseous liquid sprayed forth from it and I felt the stone beneath my feet move. That would explain the breathing floors I'd imagined. Small, aquatic creatures with mandibles and spindly limbs skittered underfoot as I moved through the weaving formations of large rocks. One stopped to look up into my eyes and let out a screech that seemed to emanate from the two holes in its head where its eyes should have been, then scurried away in a centipede fashion. I shuddered at this. Up ahead, it became apparent that the rocks formed circular formations around some startling blue light that shot from the center of them like some magnificent beacon. I wiped the moisture from my face with my wet shirt and moved on, shifting over the rounded stones until I came upon a rock formation that formed a perfect circle around the blue beacon. I moved around the thing entirely, expecting all the while to find some opening I could walk through to no avail. I climbed over the slippery rocks, moving steadily but also losing my footing every so often. Without knowing where to put my hand during one of my reaches upward, I slipped and knocked my chin against the rock in front of me. I saw white and heard my aluminum baseball bat ring as it struck the ground beneath me and rolled away into the darkness. Briefly, I wondered whether I should go back for it, but ultimately decided against it as my muscles screamed at me to keep going. I pulled myself over the top of the rocks and lost my grip, sliding down the other side into a glowing blue ring and scraping out my hands and knees. At the center of the circle of rocks was a pillar of glowing blue light that shot right up into the endless ceiling of the subterranean lair. I moved like a caveman approaching the first fire, reaching my hand out to touch the pillar of blue light. My rational side took to the forefront and I jerked my hand away, examining the pillar of light. It it was water. It was a perfect pillar of calm, bright water with no container to speak of. I circled the thing and could feel mist coming off of it. There was a form in the center of the strange body of water. It was humanoid. I circumvented the pillar until I could see its face. It was her. Her hair floated out like symmetrical angel wings on either side of her head. Her skin glowed and I had no other option than to believe that beautiful light came from her. Her eyes were closed. Her entire body looked to be frozen in stasis. Without thinking, I pushed my hand into the water. She screamed and her eyes shot open and all went dark. I was in pitch black, nothing with my hand stuck inside of water that was now rushing around. It splashed my face and felt like the ocean. I pushed into the water and swam through open, empty black space. My being was carried away and the rush of the current whipped around and tossed about. At some point I slipped out of my backpack and I was passed around from spot to spot like a rag doll. Frantically, I reached out with both my hands, daring to cling at any unknown thing I could. I felt a body slam into me, knocking the air from my lungs. I forcibly gasped through the water and could feel it filling me. I grabbed the form. It thrashed and fought and clawed against me. I could feel its wild hair whipping around in slow motion. I hugged it. I hugged her. She continued to struggle in my arms, throwing slow fists at me. I could feel our bodies sinking in the water as I could feel my consciousness leave me. It felt like a slow dream. You feel your eyes going dark while watching TV on the couch. It's like that moment before napping. Comfortable. 
Drowning was sublime, welcoming. We went limp and sank like rocks together in the cold water. My brain went black. I could feel her go still in my arms. Up above, I could see a pinhole of light. I kicked. I clamped onto her, and God, I kicked. I struggled against the jostling, angry water, pushing myself up towards that small, hopeful light. I wrapped one single arm around her waist and began clawing at the black water around me with one hand while kicking my feet. Was this some illusion? Was this the thing I see the very moment before I succumb to this watery death? Light as my brain is deprived of oxygen, then my lungs burst from being filled like popping bladders. Is this it? Do I die like this? Do I die and fail? We flew through the light and into the day. I was no longer holding on to Alice. I was on hardwood floor and my vision was blurry. I heard coughing and as I retched up brackish water onto the floor, I realized that it was me. Every breath a pinch in my chest as my shallow breaths pain through every inhale. Coughed and gagged and fell into a pile of my own vomit and water. My body collapsed and I rolled onto my side to see the woman I'd pulled with me out of the water. And there she was, on her side, gagging up great big bouts of water. I scooched across the hardwood floor of my wife's home office and patted her hard on the back, forcing up more water. We were alive. She was alive. It saved her. She stared at me with those green eyes and said, We can lay here together forever. Yeah. Forever. I smiled the biggest, dumbest grin. Forever. Tonight's story was written by the talented Lucas Worley. You can find uh, Lucas's work on Reddit under his profile, Edward the Crazy Man, all one word. And he's also published a few books on Amazon under his real name, Lucas Worley, that's W-H-O-R-L-E-Y, and I own a couple of his books, I've read them, they're really good, and can't say enough good things about Lucas as a writer, and his stuff on Reddit is is also excellent as well. He's uh, one of the first writers that I really got into on Reddit, and I appreciate him letting me read this story on the channel. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacado, Dante Kincaid, and Jaren Ray. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you all have a great night.